Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Constructive Conversations, the Resi Build podcast. Today I'm joined with Nigel from Hawkins Brown. Looking forward to an exciting conversation. This time the topic is around standardization and utilizing modern methods of construction. Welcome Nigel. Thank you Nick. Glad to have you on board and we're looking forward to an insightful conversation. But firstly, tell us a little bit about your background um, and a bit about your past experience. Sure. Okay. So, uh, Nigel Osteen, um, I'm a partner at a practice called Hawkins Brown. We are a practice of about 250 or so architects. Uh, we've got studios around the UK and in Ireland. And our work is quite broad in terms of sectors. Um, a good part of our work is in housing, but we also work in education and transport infrastructure and healthcare and other sectors. Um, from my point of view, um, I got interested in the whole area of standardization and MMC probably about 20 years or so ago, actually. And I was doing quite a lot of work at that time in the aviation sector. It was the time when uh, John Egan was a very big part of our industry. He'd come into it from the car manufacturing sector, uh, which is often a bit of a sensitive issue with architects. It's not comparing us to cars, it's different. but. Anyway, he brought in some really fresh thinking and, um, and it was certainly something I found, found quite intriguing and it informed a lot of my work at the time. And subsequently, um, I got involved with a modular housing provider called Rational House. I became a director of that company for a period of time. It was a startup. And uh, we started using a lot of the thinking that we had really picked up in that about how to standardize and how to use modern methods of construction. Um, it's a long story and I won't go into that now, but this is really my, my background. And then I guess probably where we go back now to maybe sort of 2015, 2016, and there was quite a big impetus yeah. in the UK at that point. We had the government started to get interested in how we can improve delivery of housing using MMC. And we had things like the Farmer Report, Farmer Review and well, so on. Dying. Exactly. And um, the RIBA brought out uh, an overlay to the plan of work, the RIBA plan of work, DFMA overlay. And um, so from our point of view as practice, um, we found that actually we were doing quite a lot of this already, as I think you know, people would, would find, without necessarily focusing on it as a, as a sort of sector. And um, you know, when we totted up the projects, we, at one point not long ago, we had over 50 projects which were using MMC in one form or another. Yeah. And we really just wanted to make sure that we were learning from one project to another, looking for opportunities to use MMC where it was appropriate and where it adds value to the project. Um, so, you know, so that's where I've, that's really what I do now. And amongst other things, um, I got so back in about a couple of years ago, 2021, I led um, the development of the second edition of the mm. DFMA overlay to the plan of work, which I think has been quite well received. And I think it's been reasonably influential in the way that um, the industry thinks. We, um, we introduced the term MMC advisor, where maybe we'll talk about that. It's a particular role, I think, that projects benefit from having that understanding of MMC because, you know, frankly, there's a lot of the industry that needs to be brought up to speed on this still. Um, and we focused on design iteration and the importance of early engagement. And again, I think that's something we should probably touch on. I'm involved at the moment in um, a couple of committees. Um, the BSI is looking into how we can standardize the terminology and the process of MMC because I think that all helps to yeah get it used more. So I'm on a technical committee and um, I'm leading a part of that on process. And I'm also involved in, um, there is a PAS publicly available specification, PAS 8700, which the Department for Leveling Up and Housing are sponsoring, which is for MMC in housing. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at how we can, yeah, again, sort of help promote this standardization program and sort of industrialization as i think we're starting to call it now yeah. um, in housing in particular so you, you've touched on um, on 50 of your projects where you've been looking at we'll, we'll dig into a couple of those a bit later on but um you've obviously got quite a um broad um spectrum of experience in in the topic and one of the one of the questions 
I've got about that is kind of where, where, what have been the biggest challenges or hurdles you've had to overcome in those in adopting MMC more generally? Yeah, well, look, I think, you know, we're talking about standardization, aren't we, in many respects. And I think the conversation has shifted, you know, perhaps away from, so back when the Farm Review and others came out, we started talking about categorizing the MM, different types yeah. of MMC. So we've got the, um, the seven categories of MMC now. Uh, what was that, five years ago, actually, wasn't it? 2019 when that came out. And, uh, and I think that was quite a step forward because it helped us to have a sort of common language around yeah. things. So we now talk about category one is volumetric, 3D volumetric. Category two is panelized flat pack systems. And category five, which is probably where balconies would sit, mm -hmm. you know, they're sort of non-structural um, 3D um, objects. And that was really helpful. But actually, I think we're slightly moving away from that now to more of conversation about standardization more generally. Um, but I guess for a lot of architects in particular, they're slightly concerned about that. They say, well, hang on, because, you know, I want to, I don't want you to hold back my creativity here. I want to be able to respond to, you know, the client brief and the site without really having to straightjacket it too much. So I think that is a concern with some architects. But um, I think my, I think the guess, I, I guess I would respond to that and say, look, you really don't need to worry. This is not, and I think you should look at a lot of the buildings which are being built now, particularly around housing, using modern mass construction. And I think they are, you, you can't really tell between the difference between the ones being built traditionally and the ones using MMC. And the fact is that the standardization is happening, happening sort of under the bonnet, really. And there's work that we've been involved in uh, working with local authorities and housing associations to try and help develop this. So the standardization is around, um, it, it, it helps that we have space standards in the UK. So we've got the nationally described space standards, which are mandatory in London and drive quite a lot of thinking in, um, in residential development. But that actually helps because it gives us a framework to standardize around. So we're standardizing actual room sizes. We are trying to standardize bathrooms so that we don't redesign bathrooms every yeah. time, but they're actually all pretty much the same. Yeah. So that's not adding value. And of course, we've got things like standardized um, external immunity space. So, mm. and developers will always look to, you know, they have to follow those, but they don't want to necessarily provide um, more than the standard, but it nonetheless gives us a framework to work in. So I would say to people, look, anyone who is concerned about, where we talk about standardization, this is going to be detrimental to your sort of creativity, your ability to respond to the site. I'd say you really shouldn't worry about that. In fact, if anything, I think this is helping because if you're not redesigning things from scratch, you are working from a set of, um, of pre-designed components, if you like, and standards. Actually, you're going to be more productive in that design process. Yeah. You're going to be able to work more effectively. So you're going to have more time to focus on what I think really does make a difference in terms of the visual impact. So yeah. you're thinking about the facade, treatment of the facade and maybe the sort of touch points on the building and the entrances and you know and the sort of place making more generally so I would actually the co the opposite so people say I'm really worried about standardization you're going to straight jacket me it's quite the opposite I think actually it's going to give you the opportunity as a designer to have more space to design what really makes a difference about sort of place making and uh, and the sort of visual aspects of things yeah, so spending money where it matters and saving it. Yeah, definitely. Where yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And value is a really big thing now. Yeah. And, you know, in an industry which is often constrained by cost, we've got to deliver value where it counts. And yeah. I think this is a way of doing it. Yes, yeah, so we often hear it every at conferences and exhibitions and so on about kind of pipeline standardization from module manufacturers. We talk about kind of what well, we've talked about for a few years of the limitations of kind of standardization, if you like, and it's become a kind of dirty word and a golden word at the same time. Yeah. Um, but what I'm hearing from currently is really the adoption is sort of moving away from kind of an all or nothing approach to kind of actually making sure you're applying it where it matters and the most to bring out the best, best benefits. But tell us a little bit about the... Um, some of the projects you've been involved in. I know you've been involved in the Pattern Book and a few other yeah. um, projects where you've been looking at this specifically. And I guess two two parts to the question, really. Firstly, kind of, what have you been working on in that respect? And secondly, what's the driver? Why, why are people doing that? Well, so look, we've got this huge need for housing in this country, haven't we? We are, we've been saying, I think we started off, we had a target of building 
250,000 homes a year, and then we weren't building them, so we end up to 300,000 homes a year. And I heard someone the other day saying, we're in the middle of an election, obviously, period, someone saying, actually, we need more like 500,000 homes a year now, just because we're, we're falling back, because we're not building the homes we need. And it's for all sorts of reasons to do with the way that housing, housing is built in this country. Um, but the fact is we need to be more productive. Mm. This is the thing. Productivity in the construction industry has flatlined. I mean, there's a graph that you may have seen that McKinsey produced several years ago, and it shows uh, manufacturing productivity increasing, construction productivity flatlining, worse than agriculture even, mm. which has improved. So we're just not managing to do it. And we feel that using modern methods of construction is, is fundamentally leaner way of, of um, designing and building. For some reason, it's, well, for a number of reasons, it's not, it's not quite uh, happy. Yeah. But we do have to do this. We've got to build these houses. We need a new supply chain to do that because the, um, you know, generally speaking, the larger house builders have a capacity limit that they won't be able to get above. So we've got to find new areas. And one of the ways that that can happen is through local authorities. So local authorities have a little bit more elbow room now to develop than they have in the past. Um, housing associations, registered providers also play a part in this. Um, and what we've been doing is trying to help find, working with local authorities and housing associations to try and look at ways that we can improve productivity through what we might call a sort of platform approach. So people are talking about PDFMA, Platform Design for Manufacture and Assembly now. We are effectively looking to, um, you know, effectively pre-design components and sort of larger solutions around uh, different building typologies and using that to that standardization to drive the efficiencies so we've been working on on those sort of issues and it's ranged from looking at standardizing bathrooms because as we touched on before the fact is they're all pretty much the same but they're often redesigned from scratch which is slightly mad so look, maybe we just have a standard bathroom mm. that works for everyone and one of the pieces of work we've been doing with local authority there's, a, there's an attempt to try and aggregate the buying power of local authorities generally. If they all agree on standards, they have enormous potential buying power between them and they yeah. can drive efficiencies in that. So that would be a great thing to do. And look, the same thing we've done with balconies. So, you know, balconies, um, there is huge opportunity for standardisation. And we, in the same programme that we're looking at standardising bathrooms and utility cupboards and things like that, we also looked at how we might standardise uh, balconies, and this is clearly an area that, that you know that Sapphire are very much involved in. And indeed, you know, we were speaking to you guys when we were looking at that, and we produced manuals for designers to use uh, to help them understand how they can drive those efficiencies and how to go about designing them in the first place. Um, and then we've so we've done that at one level, which is quite specific. Mm. So bathrooms, balconies, utility cupboards. But we've also looked at how you might standardise more broadly across a whole development, um, which I'd say is a sort of higher level, lighter touch standardisation. And one of the things that we have to do with all of this, it's relatively easy to come up with these ideas. We sort of know this stuff. I mean, generally in the industry, we know what to do. The trick is to get it to happen. It's a change management piece. And that's what we really have to do. So actually, and what we've doing more recently is saying, well, maybe we should scale this back a little bit, be a little bit less ambitious, actually. But in doing that, it allows us to actually take everyone forward. If you're working with a big organisation, a local authority or a big housing association, there's quite a lot of work to be done getting the whole organisation to yeah. work with you because we're notoriously fragmented as an industry. And that happens, you know, even at, at the sort of that next level. So we've been thinking about yeah, really change management. So we're saying, how can we help designers really hold their hand right from the very start, from the very first part of the project where you're looking at the site, how do you configure the buildings on the site, you're looking at sort of plan depths and things yeah. like that, saying, look, there is a degree of standardization which we know we'll end up at because yeah. we've got space standards and things like that. So let's work from there. We've got, we've developed apartment layouts um, which can fundamentally be built using a range of different structural systems so they can be built, they could be built traditionally, but they can be built using um, light gauge steel or a cross wall system or sort of generally precast. But they can be built 
without having to change the design because there are slight differences in mm. all of those requirements. So if you standardize that, then when it comes to the point when you go, to, go out to tender, you've got a bit more commercial opportunity to try different uh, suppliers and different routes and so on. So that's really what we've been focusing on. It's that sort of quite high level, yeah. uh, helping clients, helping them through those early stages and then allowing them that commercial freedom when it comes to that really important part where they're going out to tender. So do you think that's the secret of making it become mainstream? I think it is. So look, we were touching on the, the MMC categories and you know there are seven MMC categories. And I think one of the, and I mentioned that piece of work I'm doing for the British Standards Institute. And we're just looking at those and saying, actually, do they really define what we need as an industry? They're a really good starting point. Yeah. And actually they're pretty comprehensive. Good. But there are nuances within some of the categories, particularly category one and category five, actually, which we think could do with some further explanation. Um, so, but the, the main point to remember, I think, for all designers is that uh, is pretty much no building is 100% MMC. They're all hybrids in some respect. Yeah. So what you've got to do is look at combining different systems, combining traditional with MMC, and making the most, uh, you know, really to deliver the most value. So it's, um, it's never black and white. Uh, so from our point of view at Hawkins Brown, we always have a workshop right at the beginning of the project mm. to understand what might be the drivers in all sorts of things, but MMC is one of them. What are the opportunities for that? And, um, and we try to understand, look at, you know, is it a category one? Category one is quite difficult. <laughs> yeah. Category two a bit easier. Category three is another whole area in category five. So they're the ones that we focus on. So I think it's really, it's become, it's more nuanced than it's just all going to be volumetric or it's all going to do this. It never is. It's generally a hybrid. And I mentioned that role of MMC advisor earlier on. That's a role that we think really, it doesn't fully exist in the industry, but I think we need yeah. to be doing it. It could be, it could be the architect if they've got enough knowledge of MMC. It could be the client if they're a very experienced client that they have that. Yeah. Or it could be a specialist who comes in and joins the design team right from the beginning and they will be able to say, to help the architect if they don't have the experience in this, to say what would be the appropriate systems or combination of systems. Let's look at the site, let's look at the logistics to see where the factories might be and, you know, basic things like can you get a crane on the site, to, you know, all these sort of logistical type issues as well. So I think it's come, become more nuanced. Really. So you're talking Reba stage zero one, uh, really early doors in the project. Yes, I think, yeah, we need to, um, I think clients are often a little bit reluctant to get too many consultants on board at the beginning, particularly in residential where there's often a big pivot point around planning approval. Yep. And there's a reluctance to invest more than you have to before you understand the risk profile which is really governed by planning but it's i think it can be it can be quite light touch but at the same time it's critical to have yes you've got to be considering these things stage zero is really the client stage where they think about you know do i need a building stage one is really about looking at the feasibility of the site what can i fit on i think you really need to be doing from stage two you need to be starting to think about this so stage two is where you actually designing the building you're thinking about the concepts and it's at that point that for most of the MMC systems, you really need to be engaging perhaps through someone, you know, MMC advisor, whether that's someone who's actually on the team already or an external consultant, but that's when yeah. you need to start speaking to the manufacturers to get their input and to understand what the constraints of yeah. or opportunities that those manufacturing systems would bring to you. So with the BSR and the whole new regime we're, we're now working on in, in the UK um, for high risk buildings, um, Obviously, there's certain components which need to be designed in early. Um, they're fundamental for the gateways and so on as well. But what particular components, um, in your experience, do you think need designing in early? Both when you take the consideration of what we've been talking about, really the standardisation, making it work from an MMC point of view, but also applying the kind of the layer of complexity we now have um, with the post Grenfell regulations. Yeah, so we have, talking about the, the sort of gateway one around planning, which is fairly light touch, fire safety, um, understanding, demonstrating that you have designed with some understanding of life safety mm. systems. Gateway two, I guess, is the is the really big one. Um, and I guess it's worth distinguishing between buildings that are high-risk buildings and non-high-risk buildings. Yeah. So you ever talk about the Building Safety Act, getting a little bit technical here, but so um, as people probably know, 
for buildings which are uh, below six storeys or with um, less than two residential units, they're non-HRBs, but buildings which are above six storeys with two, res two or more residential units are HRBs, high-risk buildings, and they have to go through the gateway process. Mm -hmm. And gateway two is, um, is the submission of the building regulations application and the approval of that. And for HRBs, you cannot proceed on site until you've got that. And there's also much greater focus, therefore, on the whole building design. No longer can we design the building while we're building it. In that sense, it's just not allowed anymore. You you won't get permission, building regs permission. So we have to consider particularly the life safety, the, the sort of life safety critical elements of design. Mm -hmm. Fire is one of those. Structural safety is another. There's a great little document that uh, the RIBA with the CIOB published, I don't know, about a year or so ago, um, setting out the sort of for designers what are the life safety critical issues and of course balconies is is one of those issues um, but it's also understanding more generally about um, fire safety in buildings so yeah I think there's more focus on that and as designers we know now that we have to do these things and we largely have to get it all tied up before we start on for the contractor starts on site before the principal contractor is working there so yeah it just gives us um, gives more impetus to that conversation with manufacturers. And I think that's a good thing because I think it, it leads to better quality um, yeah. and ultimately, I think, better outcomes for, for projects. But it is something which, which we need to make sure the clients understand. Absolutely, and because it's happening pre-planning, some of those costs can be designed out which would have otherwise been fixed if, if planning in the old, um, you know, taking planning last year and the year before and so on, um, may have, fixed in our, our minds they can't actually control certain aspects without going back in for the planning and permission alteration. Well there's a big yeah so not only do we have to fundamentally completely design the building at gateway mm. two before we start building if you change the building during construction it's, it's quite yeah. difficult there's a quite a long there's a period of six weeks of approval for every significant change so it's really in, in a sense that's helping I think that's probably going to help MMC and you know pre-manufactured designs yeah. because it's going to be rather more locked in um, you know, you can't even, uh, people are saying you can't even change from one plasterboard manufacturer to another because they might have quite different um, requirements. So this is going to be the case for any significant component in a building. It means that it has to be, and the, and the clients and contractors will sort of have to get their head around this from a commercial point of view, uh, but it does mean that we've got to fix the design. And uh, yeah, as I say, that's, that's bound to lead to better quality because yeah. residential in particular, but I mean all sectors, uh, we're renowned for having the dreaded value engineering happening and um, and that's usually cost cutting isn't it yeah. rather than you know it, increasing value yeah. and uh, you know we always we, we must design with value in mind because that's very important but assuming we've done that I think it's important to maintain the integrity of the of the building once we've done it yeah and these these major changes ultimately what the the, the purpose I guess behind it is the fact that um, it's moving people towards thinking about these changes and actually weighing up, do I really need to do it? Because it's going to be a brave person which goes in for a cost-related yeah. change, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, I think those days are, it's going to get increasingly hard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're only just starting on this journey. <laughs> we're only getting the first HRB's Absolutely. applications going in. So uh, it's going to be interesting over the next sort of 18 months or so to see how this pans out. But yeah, my feeling is that we're going to have to make quite a significant shift in our attitude towards these things as an industry and understand that we we really do need to get it right first time yeah. so zooming back out onto kind of the the bu you touched on the beginning about projects and experience and applying it you've obviously got broad experience in 50 50 projects there um if we touch on one of the first ones was um deptford wharves yeah um projects in south london um tell us a little bit about your kind of vision for the project there, how you assessed and looked to that kind of that aspirational piece of what you wanted to do with MMC and perhaps what the barriers were to that as well. Well, I mean, we had, uh, going back to the sort of beginning of this, we looked at the project quite broadly with Lendlease about how to, you know, the different systems we might use. Um, and this is not uncommon, but in the end, the project has been built, in many ways built, built traditionally. Um, it, with concrete, um, but that's not to say that we didn't explore different um, areas at the beginning. But 
we understood it needed to have um, it would be of high quality. It's a brick, fundamentally a brick building, series of buildings. And um, so it's, it's four blocks, which are connected by a podium, which has retail space at the bottom. It's um, about just over 250 um, built to rent homes, ranging from one beds to, to four beds. Um, and as I say, whilst it mainly consists of brickwork, um, there are slight variations in cladding to reference to reflect um, the origins of the site, which are industry and around shipbuilding, um, heritage and so on. And, uh, but the balconies are always going to be important as they are in a lot of residential projects. They can often be quite a, provide quite a lot of definition about the visual character mm -hmm. of the building. And um, we, um, we've worked very closely with you guys on that. Um, we, in fact, uh, ended up talking about standardization. We've been able to rationalize the design so that we have a single size of balcony for all the apartments, which in terms of efficiency, I think has worked enormously well. Um, but I think if you were to look at the design, you wouldn't say that it was a boring building. I think quite the opposite. I think it's, uh, I think there's a place for sort of rational design in these things. But in fact, the balconies um, give it some, you know, quite a lot of interplay uh, mm. visually. And I think that's, uh, that we see that as a very positive thing. So we've got, uh, I don't know, about 220 odd balconies uh, there all together. And what we've done is we've been able to shift them around across the apartments to give that, that sort of variation in, um, in appearance. So they're not, they're not all sort of stacked one top mm. of another. And I think that's quite important. Um, so, yeah, so we, you know, we worked, I think, and this is common to all of us, it's not just with balconies, but it's with, with all sorts of different things. And I've talked about different parts of residential buildings. We fundamentally see the value in working closely with the manufacturers at an early stage. Mm. Um, it helps us to understand all sorts of drivers, um, technical issues as well um, as aesthetic ones. And um, yeah, it's good to sort of form some sort of relationship to, to be able to do that, I think. So, so where was the benefit? Um, okay. Well, actually, firstly, if we, if we could ask, um, do you feel that process was streamlined by rationalisation or would you say it was limited by rationalisation? Um, I don't, it's certainly, no, it's something which I think we've been able to achieve, I would say. Um, so I think we've got, I think we've managed in this project anyway, I'd say that we've achieved that level of standardisation, as I say, but without detriment to, um, you know, to the look and feel of the building. It, I mentioned how, you know, when you standardise things like this, you can sort of focus on the whole placemaking issue mm. and the, the, the sort of uh, the aesthetic um, side of things. And no, I would say that that's been, um, that's been an advantage, really. So talking about one of the other projects you've been working on, um, the former Citroen garage in Capital Way in Brentford, um, tell us a little bit about the ambitions on that particular one. It was with Hill Partnership at yeah. Developers and Normandy. Um, so this is a, another residential mixed-use building. Um, in this case, it's about 440 uh, units. 50% of that is affordable. We've touched on the need for increasing our housing provision, and you know it's not just housing generally, what we really need is affordable housing in this country. So it's nice to have a scheme where we have such a high proportion of affordable housing, but it includes ancillary uses like uh, they've got a nursery, it's got commercial mm. uh, units, it's got a play space, um, some you know, interesting landscape mm. and public realm. Um, and originally, in fact, in this case, the, um, the balconies were going to be traditional. Concrete. Yep and um yeah in situ and um it was ve'd <laughs> as a result of fluctuating market rates um and we came to select sapphire um as a sort of bolt-on solution um it was quicker it, it was a quicker uh, program uh, it was easier to install because there was no scaffolding required and lifted in by a crane um i think we got better quality control. Um, we had wanted to get a, uh, a grey soffit, uh, which would have had to have been painted before, but uh, off-site solution means that we can achieve that quite easily. 
um, the balconies have a free draining system um, and um, we've been able to you know, remove external downpipes and things like that so it's all it's all very positive so yeah it was interesting so whereas I was saying that you know well the trick is to engage early uh, it's not saying that you can't change things but you need to do it I think you know you need to be very careful about this and uh, you know in this case we've been working very closely with the contractor um, to manage these processes but yeah it's been a sort of happy, happy circumstance in a way because I think we've come out with a better solution um, perhaps than we had originally. So what would you say helped streamline that process um, and you know, gain the benefits most in, in kind of um, in helping actually move from a traditional concrete based approach to a more modern um, glide and mouth leak? Um, well I think you need to have a good understanding of the technical requirements clearly we have to we have to work with you know um, the engineers we're working with and with the manufacturer to understand uh, what that does um, because you know clearly there is an impact um, uh, we have to un uh, or a change anyway that we have to understand so I think um, you know what we look for always uh, across anything that we're doing is to have a uh, you know suppliers that we feel we can um, work collaborate with really and understand the technical drivers and uh, which helps us understand what the opportunities are so I think it's that relationship really um, that's really important so again it comes back to that collaboration piece and working together if you like um, for mutual benefit and last question for me um, collaboration often comes um, with its challenges um, you've obviously got a couple of um, good examples there of, of where it's worked well but what do you think the main barrier is to collaboration and how do we move away from that um, as an as a industry generally? Yeah, so so I think, you know, we do, the, the barriers are, I think, mainly around um, procurement and we have to overcome those. And um, I think we've perhaps got a little bit of help. We were talking about the Building Safety Act. Maybe that's going to help a little bit yeah. because there's going to be a need to, you know, make decisions perhaps a bit earlier than than has sometimes been the case. Um, but yeah, collaboration is is difficult though. I don't think you can take it for granted. I think you have to you have to build a bit of trust actually, and I think that comes largely from having worked successfully on things. That's across everything. So it's between consultants, you know, architects and engineers. It's between designers and suppliers. It's with contractors as well, particularly when we're looking at having pre-construction services agreements, which is increasingly the case, two-stage tendering and mm -hmm. so on. So I think it's about, um, I think for me, collaboration comes through having dialogue and, yeah. you know, we have to talk to each other. And I think that's the really important thing. Let's not sort of worry about, you know, and that includes if something's not going quite right. I think you've got to be quite open about it and share that. And in my experience, whenever you do that, um, the more engagement you have, with everyone, including the client, I should say, actually. Some of the buildings I'm proudest of in my career have been where my relationship with the client has been really good and they've been fully engaged and I think you need that. So I'd say that collaboration comes, there are barriers to it around procurement and so on, but I think we can overcome those just through, you know, talking to each other. Yeah. Passive house seems to be an ever-increasing conversation, particularly for local authorities mm. um, and social housing. In your opinion, what's the driver behind that and, and why are people talking about this? Yeah, it's interesting. So um, we've got a number of certified passive house designers in the practice. It's, uh, it's developed some momentum, I think, over the last few years. But I think the reality is that, um, unfortunately, um, sustainability is not a particular driver for the sale of houses. So the house builders, unfortunately, are less interested in it, I would suggest, for that reason. However, um, there is still a good amount of this being built. We are building um, a large passive house development in Camden for the local authority. Um, and the driver there is fuel poverty, really. So this is affordable housing. So there's a fundamental difference, as I say, between private housing and affordable housing. Private housing, unfortunately, there's probably less interest just because it's market driven. Yeah. And unfortunately, the market is still not driving um, sales as much in terms of sustainability. However, when you're trying to save energy in an area where energy costs are going up, that's where we want to get those better air tightness standards and following passive house process. So where it's happening is 
probably in self-built where you have people who are interested in achieving better quality homes from that point of view. But it's also starting to happen in affordable housing and it's driven, as I say, by those by local authorities and, uh, and perhaps by housing associations in due course. Yeah. As we sum up here, we'll be keen on the um, takeaway from you, Nigel, for the audience. Um, what you, what, how would you sum up the conversation and what one key takeaway can, can you give to the audience? Um, well, I'm going to say maybe a couple of things. I'm going to say, I think, you know, we touched on this, but I think the early engagement is really important. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to do that. Um, but I'd also say perhaps to my architect colleagues, don't be afraid of standardisation. Um, I think there is a great deal of benefit from it. It's something that I've learned over years of being an architect, but it's become increasingly evident to me that we have to standardise. I mean, as I say, we start, we're starting to talk about this industrialisation even. Mm. even. Um, but I think we have to standardise. But that's not to say that we are coming up with uh, buildings which look the same everywhere. Mm. We can still have great room for creativity, but what's underneath the chassis is what we're standardising. And I think that's the way to improving, you know, getting the houses that we need in the country. It's a great analogy, um, what's, what's beneath the chassis there. And I think my key takeaway from this conversation as well is standardisation isn't an all or nothing. Um, a lot can be done in a clever way, but it does depend, as you say, on the collaboration and the early working together. So, Yeah, um, definitely. Nigel, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure interviewing you, a very insightful topic here. Um, thank you for all the audience who have joined us today as we've explored standardisation and the um, way we can make it work successfully on a larger scale in housing. Thank you very much, and we look forward to you joining us again on our next podcast in the ResiBuild Constructive Conversations. Thank you, and goodbye from us. Mm -hmm.